Hello, this is Dr. Eric Bricker, and thank you for watching A Healthcare Z. As you can see, I'm wearing an A Healthcare Z t shirt. Now, this was a gift from my wife for our anniversary, so of course, I had to wear it for today's video. And today, we're going to be discussing a Mayo Clinic documentary that was on PBS. And it's actually available on Netflix as well, and it is fantastic. So, I highly encourage you to watch it. And it was highly instructive about how the history of the founding of the Mayo Clinic is actually very relevant to employee health plans today, specifically because this documentary talks about the foundational pillars upon, upon which Mayo was built and what really made Mayo special and why it's this renowned medical institution of worldwide repute. And so we're going to go through those pillars now. So pillar number one, the physicians and surgeons are on salary. So interestingly, the founding physician of Mayo, Dr. W.W. W. Mayo, this was his idea. And this was a unique idea at his time because, believe it or not, so FFS is fee for service. So even back in the 1800s when Mayo was founded, most physicians were fee for service. And he said, no, they need to be on salary because we don't want the physicians remuneration to be based upon their doing more procedures, or in his case, surgeries, because he was a surgeon. He thought it would bias their opinion. So he said, if you work at Mayo, you're going to be on salary. And there also then wasn't competition around like stealing patients or giving up patients, etc., because you're going to get paid regardless of that. Okay, so that's a very important foundational pillar of Mayo that exists today. And oh, by the way, the vast majority of doctors in America do not work on salary. They're fee for service. So note that there's that huge difference there between Mayo and most doctors in America. Okay, pillar number two. Multiple specialties would revolve around the patient instead of the patient having to go from place to place to place. Now, this was really important back in the late 1800s and early 1900s because that's when specialization within medicine was just beginning. You were just starting to have things like endocrinologists and hematologists. It wasn't just the one country doctor that did everything. And that was because of the explosion of medical information. It was impossible for one person to effectively know everything. So you had to have specialization just so that you could have competence. Okay, great, but that specialization needed to be coordinated. It needed to revolve around the patient. And that's what they do at Mayo. They will have all those specialists come together and literally meet with the patient, as opposed to in today's world where it's really a patient being ping-ponged among specialist one and then specialist two and then specialist three and then specialist four and then back to specialist one. And there's a very excellent example of this in the Mayo documentary about a woman with lupus who it was affecting her heart and her lungs and her kidneys and her brain. It was so bad that she was literally admitted to a hospital over a hundred times within a three to four year period. And it was only at Mayo in seeing a rheumatologist there that she was diagnosed within 20 minutes that she had lupus because all of the physicians were revolving around her because this one illness affected all these different organs but they were all interconnected. And guess what? That's really how the body works. It's interconnected. Okay, last pillar is Mayo adopted early proven scientific processes. So the reason why the Mayo Clinic was so famous in its early days is because they adopted what was, is referred to as aseptic technique. You gotta remember in the early 1800s, they had just quote unquote discovered germs. And so it was a new, it was actually discovered in Scotland, it was a new idea to actually like wash your hands before surgery, to use sterile instruments and not to reuse the same instrument from patient to patient to patient. Remember, that's what they did during the Civil War. Okay, so Mayo did that. And it might have been like the first hospital in America to do that. And guess what happened? Of the 400 first surgeries that were done at Mayo, only two people died. That is amazing. And guess what happened? Word spread. And people came from all over the country to go to Mayo to get their surgery done because the doctors washed their hands and used clean scalpels, right? And so, of course, that spread across the country to other hospitals as well. That was a huge innovation. So Mayo was an early adopter of that innovation. They had medical records. They, went, they had centralized medical records before everybody used to keep it 
uh, their own, each doctor had their own separate record about each patient, and they would, the, the record would never go around, so they would never know what all the other doctors were thinking. So Mayo actually developed a medical records department with one chart for each patient that the doctors would share. That was highly innovative. It was a process. What they also did is they had the pathology department right next to the operating room. They would take samples of tissue, they would freeze it on the window pane, and they would section it and they would look at it under a microscope while the person was still in the operating room to see if, they, if the surgeon had gotten all of the tumor or if the tumor was cancerous or non-cancerous. And so it would determine intraoperatively what the surgeon would do based on the pathology. And to this day, the pathology department is next to the operating room in the Mayo Clinic. And that was highly effective in having better outcomes for cancer surgery. Okay, why am I saying this? Because these processes are not adopted necessarily by all hospitals in America. And a contemporary example of that is what's referred to as antibiotic stewardship. And antibiotic stewardship is where the ID department or the ID doctors actually set a protocol for which incredibly powerful antibiotics can be used in certain infection situations. In other words, very strong antibiotics are only used in very severe infections. Because if you use very strong antibiotics for minor infections, one, you develop bacterial resistance, and two, you end up killing all of the good bacteria in your large intestine, which allows for then overgrowth of bad bacteria, and that's referred to as Clostridium difficile colitis. And it can cause you to have your colon surgically removed, or it can even cause you to die. And let me tell you, where I did my residency at Johns Hopkins, where they had an antibiotic stewardship program, I saw three cases of Clostridium difficile colitis in three years. And when I worked at a community hospital, I saw one case almost a week. And what was the difference? That community hospital did not have an antibiotic stewardship program, and Johns Hopkins did. And I will tell you that adopting these processes is crucially important, not only for patient safety, but for outcomes as well. Okay, fascinating documentary. What is the practical application of this uh, for employee health plans. And it is, listen, you can't send everybody to the Mayo Clinic. That's not practical. But there are places that have physicians and surgeons on Saturday. There are places that have multiple specialties that's, that revolve around the patient. There are places that have early proven um, processes in place. And those places tend to be academic medical centers. So those are hospitals associated with medical schools and residency programs. The physicians are typically on salary. Now, I will tell you from an expense standpoint, not all academic medical centers are cost effective because they have essentially really ratcheted up their unit costs. So we're talking like two to four thousand dollars an MRI. We're talking very expensive surgery. So in terms of an effectiveness and a quality standpoint, they're fantastic. But from a cost effectiveness standpoint, not necessarily. Now I will tell you here in Dallas Fort Worth, we're unique in that the UT Southwestern Medical Center, which is the big academic medical center where we are, they are actually not a huge powerhouse in the metro area, so therefore they have not ratcheted up their unit cost. So it's kind of the best of both worlds if you happen to be in DFW. It's cost effective and you get this sort of Mayo-like approach. Now, with that being said, it's not even practical for everybody to go to an academic medical center. So when should you do it? This is just my opinion. It's when, hey, you have a questionable diagnosis like that lady with lupus. I don't really, I don't know what's going on. I'm confused. And oftentimes, again, the, the community physicians, they may refer you to the academic physician, but a lot of times the patient has to take it into their own hands and do it themselves. Next up, for complex diagnoses. So this is where, you know, even for something like, you know, ductal carcinoma in situ for breast cancer, that might be more quote unquote straightforward, but let's say you have metastatic breast cancer. Well, that is a more, absolutely more complex situation, and it might behoove you to be in an academic medical center for that. And then next, with complications. So even for run-of-the-mill uh, procedures that have had complications, you might want to get to an academic medical center. A common situation there is for a laparoscopic cholecystectomy, which is a gallbladder surgery, very common for gallstones. One of the complications is where they damage the bile ducts. And that's where oftentimes the surgeon might want to hold on to them and try to fix them themselves. But fixing bile ducts is incredibly complex surgery. And so, especially where I went to medical school, we would see referrals into the academic medical center for repair of the bile ducts in those situations. So, that is my summary today of the Mayo Clinic documentary and how it relates to, relates to your employee benefit plans. And thank you for watching A Healthcare Z.